So in this question, we've been asked to prepare a consolidated statement of financial position. We've got a couple of investments, so we need to investigate those. Um, and we've also been given a statement of financial position. We know from experience that we have to add in goodwill to our list of assets. PPE, perfectly acceptable for property, plant and equipment. Intangibles, inventories, receivables, cash. And I know strictly I should say cash and cash equivalents, but you're not going to lose any marks in the exam if you just say cash. Share capital. share premium, retained earnings, revaluation surplus, and again experience tells us that we need to put in an NCI, because an NCI is part of equity. So there we go, non-controlling interest, We've got some deferred tax. I appreciate you won't have done deferred tax yet, but I'm going to hold that back for an excitement, exciting moment later this year, just for you. And trade payables. Notice I've, I've not done this as well as the question itself. I've not put in current liabilities and non-current liabilities. It doesn't really make any difference. You get marks for the things that you calculate and where you apply your knowledge. So that's our pro forma. Now I'm going to set up our workings. And the first thing that we need to determine is our group structure. This is quite a difficult question to get our teeth around. There's a lot of information. But the examiner does sometimes present information in a slightly unusual way. So we have Otway. And Otway has an investment in Holgarth. And what is that um, investment? Well, we've bought 320 million. If we look at the information on page 317, we've bought 320 million shares, haven't we? Out of a grand total of 400 million shares, which means that we have an 80% investment. So the examiner has twisted the way he's given information. I think at F7 we anticipated we bought 60% or 70%. Here we might have to do some ferreting around, which means that the NCI have the other 20%. Now, when it comes to Butterbee, we have bought 55 million shares. Butterby has 220 million shares, which means that we've got a 25% investment. Remember, there is no NCI when you're dealing with an associate. So I'm not going to put a 75% NCI into the calculation. We're then going to have a net assets working. I'm going to go to the next page for this, I think. And I'm going to do one for Holgarth at the SFP and the acquisition date, and one for Butterby at the SFP. and the acquisition date. And I'll come back to that later. Working number three is goodwill. We're going to do goodwill for Holgarth only.
working for is the NCI. Working five is reserves and I'm just going to put in retained earnings. I might end up putting my revaluation surplus as well. And indeed, the examiner quite often likes to give you retained earnings and other earnings. So you, so sometimes you might, will have more than one column for reserves. And because we've got an associate, whenever you have an associate, have a separate working for associates as well. So this is my standard approach to all questions. Look at the requirements here. I'm just going to focus on the statement of financial position. Whatever the examiner gives to me in the question, I give to him back, plus goodwill, plus NCI. Now here, I also suspect, having determined that we've got an associate, remember I said write on every few lines and always leave spaces, I'm going to have an extra line in respect of associates having because we've identified that we've got an associate in the question let's now work our way through the question line by line so the, the, at the start of the question we're given information about the share capital share premium and retained earnings of our investments so what we can do is we can put that information into our net assets working. Share capital, share premium, retained earnings, revaluation surplus. So for Holgarth, it's 400 for share capital. 140 for share premium, 120 for retained earnings, and 40 for revaluation surplus. We're then told the fair value of the assets. So I'm going to put in fair value total. Notice I'm leaving a space, a fair value total of 800. And we're given the cost of the investment. What is the cost of investment used to calculate? It is used to calculate goodwill. So I'm going to take that information. Cost of investment 765 into my goodwill calculation. The ordinary share capital acquired we've used in working number one to determine goodwill. So can you see I've taken every single figure, every time you convert a figure from the exam paper to your answer sheet, it's a potential contribution to a mark. Next we come to Butterby, or Batterby, whatever we want to call it, and at the acquisition date, share capital 220, share premium 83, retained earnings 195, revaluation surplus 54. The fair value of the net assets we are told is 652 and the cost of the investment is 203. Now we've established that Batterby is an associate so we measure the associate at cost plus share of profit since acquisition. So I'm now going to go to my associate working Cost of investment 203. So that's dealt with our initial piece of information. We've now got our three statements of financial position. And one of the most difficult things when dealing with group questions is to leave out the assets and liabilities of the associate because you just want to add them in there. I know you do, but we're going to resist. So again, say for property, plant and equipment, 1,012 plus 920. For intangibles, it's 350 for the subsidiary only. 
the investment in Holgarth and the investment in Batterby, well, we've used those figures, haven't we? We've used the figure of 765 for our cost of investment, and we've used the figure of 203 for our associates. We've dealt with that information. We now go to current assets. Six twenty plus fourteen sixty, so it's parent and subsidiary only. For receivables, nine hundred and fifty plus five hundred and twenty nine, parent and subsidiary only, nine hundred plus five hundred and ten for cash, parent and subsidiary only. Equity, we've got share capital of one thousand for the parent. And my advice is always treat share premium identically to the way that you treat share capital. So therefore, it's just the figures in relation to the parent company that I'm going to enter. For Holgarth and Batterby, I've got 40140. So 40140 and 220. And 83. It is very, very rare to see differences in share capital and share premium as far as your subsidiary companies are concerned. It makes life far too complicated. We've then got retained earnings. We've got retained earnings for Holgarth, whilst we're on working number two, are 809. And I've got a revaluation surplus of 70. And for Batterby, I've got figures of 263 and 62. So those figures have changed since acquisition. And then I'm going to go to the parent. I'm going to go to reserves. And because the revaluation surplus has changed since acquisition, I'm going to have a separate column for revaluation surplus. And for the parent, we put in 100% of those figures. So that's retained earnings 1128 and revaluation surplus of 142. We've got deferred tax liability. Let's go back up. One hundred plus fifty, so that's a grand total of one hundred and fifty. We've got trade and other payables eighteen eighty plus two thousand three hundred like so. All the time I'm leaving off the assets of. The associate. Now remember, I'm not going to go through the statement of comprehensive income in this particular question at this time. Um, so let's skip the, the profit and loss and take a look at the additional information. Note A, neither Holgarth nor Batterby had any reserves other than the retained earnings and share premium, and they've not issued shares since acquisition. That ties in with the numbers. Note B, the fair value difference on the subsidiary relates to PPE. And on the associate, it relates to a piece of land. So let's go down here and let's just work out what's happening. 400 plus 140 is 540 plus 120 is 660 plus 40 is 700. And yet we've been told the fair value is 800. So our fair value adjustment is the balancing figure. If I put in a figure of 100, I now balance to my fair value. So I'm also going to put in 100 at the SFP date because we still have those assets. So think about what we've done. We've had a revaluation. It's effectively credit fair value revaluation and debit <laughs> PPE, so I'm going to go up to PPE plus 100, which is my fair value adjustment, like so.
We're then told we're depreciating assets over five years. When did we acquire the subsidiary? It was on the 1st of July, X2. We're at the 30th of June, X6. So we've got a remaining useful life of 10 years. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to charge depreciation on the fair value. So the fair value adjustment was 800 and I'm going to charge four years depreciation out of 10 years. Sorry, the fair value adjustment was 100 and four tenths of that means I'm going to put through a depreciation adjustment of 40. So I've revalued the asset up by 100 four years ago, but I'm depreciating the asset over 10 years. So we're four years down the line. So I've got to charge 40 depreciation. And what are we charging depreciation on? We charge depreciation on PPE. The fair value of difference on the associate relates to a piece of land. So let's go to our associate, and add this up. I've got 220 plus 83 plus 195 plus 54. That adds up to 552. The fair value is 652. So again, there is a fair value adjustment of 100 but nothing is put through as far as the PPE is concerned because think of the associate as one line consolidation so I'm simply just going to put that through as a fair value adjustment. Note C group policy is to measure NCI at fair value the fair value at the acquisition date was 188 million. So I'm going to go to my NCI calculation and say at acquisition 188 million. And also in my goodwill calculation, I've got the cost of the investment plus the NCI at acquisition 188 million. Note D. Now this is sort of classic examiner. He will stick in a random point in relation to your F7 studies. So Holgarth's intangibles include 87 million of training and marketing costs incurred in the year. They, the directors believe they should be capitalized because they relate to a startup business and intend to amortize the yeah, over five years. Well, you cannot capitalize training costs or marketing costs because it doesn't satisfy the definition of an asset. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce the value of intangibles by 87. But when I'm putting through adjustments, I'm thinking debit and credit. So here I'm effectively crediting intangibles 87 and therefore I'm going to debit the income statement of my subsidiary. The income statement flows through into retained profits. So I'm going to go down to retained profits of Holgarth and say intangible take away 87. Now I've not made enough space for myself here so what I'm going to do I'm just going to move this this note down and create a little bit of extra space and you do tend to find at P2 that working number two can be quite big so just watch out for that let me just quickly erase that thing about these laptops as well as having magic ink they have magic erasers as well. Um, note E. During the year Holgarth sold goods to Otway so this is the subsidiary selling goods to the parent. We need to work out 
intragroup profit. So working number seven, profit in inventories. We go back to basics, cost plus profit equals sales price. And we sold goods to Otway for 1300 now, it's that 1300 that we would adjust for in the income statement. We would reduce both revenue and cost of sales by 1300 The company makes a profit of 30% on the selling price. So I'm going to say my profit is 30%, 30% of my selling price like so. 140 million of these goods were held by Otway at the year end. So you always take the figure in your closing inventories. So that's 140. How do we work out the profit? Because it's the profit that we have to adjust for. It's the figure that we know, which is 140, multiplied by the percentage that we are looking to calculate, which is 30%. 30% of what? It's 30% of selling price, which gives us a figure of 42 million as our adjustment. So I'm going to credit group inventories with that 42 and I'm going to debit the reserves of the seller and here Holgarth has sold the goods to the parent company so I'm going to debit the reserves of Holgarth. So credit in group inventories 42 debit the reserves of Holgarth. Holgarth is our subsidiary, so I'm going to go here to my net assets working. 42. Inventory profit, working number seven, like so. And I need to also put that through against inventories minus 42 from working number 7. Note F, annual impairment tests have indicated 100 million relating to the goodwill of Holgarth. No impairment losses are in respect of Batterby. What I'm going to do, I'm going to my, go to my goodwill calculation and say less impairment. I don't know what the figure is yet, but I'm going to reduce it by a grand total of 100. The 25 million is the amount we would charge to cost of sales. Because we are using the fair value method, the goodwill reduction is allocated between the group and the NCI. So I'm going to go to my NCI calculation and say less goodwill impaired and their share is 20% of 100 which is 20 like so and for the group I'm going to say goodwill impaired eighty percent of a hundred, which is eighty, like so. So we've therefore dealt with all of the information in the question, and when you reach that part of the question, I would always go to your net assets working and add up the numbers and look at the movements since acquisition. So we go to working number two. So we've got a grand total for net assets of 800 at the date of acquisition. And as you can see, there's a lot of figures here. and 1350 at the SFP date. So that's a total increase of 550 but 
what is that? Well, 30 of that increase relates to the revaluation reserve. Can you see it's gone up from 40 to 70? So what I'm going to say here is plus 30 in our revaluation surplus, and therefore it must be an increase of 520 in retained earnings. So the total increase I'm recognising is 550. If we now take a look at Batterby, 220 plus 83 plus 263 plus 62 plus 162 comes to a grand total of 728. And we can say here plus 8 for our revaluation surplus. The total increase, 728 less 652, the total increase is 76, so it must be plus 68. For retained earnings. And indeed that's the movement in our retained earnings total. We're now going to calculate goodwill. We've got the cost plus the NCI acquisition. I'm then going to take away net assets at acquisition. We pick up net assets at acquisition from working number two. And net assets at acquisition were 800. So 765 plus 188 less 800 is 153. Take away the impairment. leaves us with a goodwill figure of 53. Goodwill is an intangible asset. So we go up to our statement of financial position here, 53 from working number three. Okay. Next working It's going to be the NCI. We've got the figures at acquisition. We're then going to give them their share since acquisition. For retained earnings, it's 20%. 20% of what? It's 20% of the increase of 520. So we pick up the increase from working number two. That gives me a figure of 104. Now, what do I do at this stage? I always ask myself que the question, if I'm going to give the NCI 20%, what are you going to do with the other 80%? They belong to the group. So I'm going to go to group returned earnings, share of subsidiary retained earnings, eighty percent of five twenty which is four one six and we've also got a revaluation surplus of thirty so I go to the the NCI share since acquisition revaluation 20 percent of 30 is 6. What do we do with the other 80 percent of the revaluation? That again belongs to the parent company. So share of revaluation 80 percent of 30 but notice I'm now putting this into my revaluation surplus column. So that deals with the figures in respect of the subsidiary company. We then have our 
associate. Oops. And what are we going to do for the associate? I'm going to give the associate the share since acquisition of retained earnings. What's our investment in the associate? It's we established that in working number one, it's 25%. Retained earnings, what's happened to retained earnings? They've increased by, we go up to working number two, they've increased by 68. So 25% of 68 is 17. And of the revaluation, it's 25% of 8 which is 2. So our associate adds up to 222. These figures are also added into group reserves. So the associate since acquisition retained earnings 17 revaluation 2. So you can see that at P2 when we're doing the calculations there's often and that should actually be retained earnings should be there and the revaluation surplus so let's get those in the right columns. So there's a lot of adjustments to put through. Revaluation surplus is 168. Retained earnings is 1481. So I'm going to take those figures of 1481 and 168 up to my statement of financial position. And all I'm doing now, I'm doing housekeeping. There's no extra marks given for doing this. But it's just I'm just doing now doing it out of curiosity. Is it going to balance? Retained earnings one four eight one from working number five. We've got a revaluation surplus again from working number five, which was, was that one six eight? I've got on myself now. Yeah, it was one six eight. We had our associate being valued at 222 in working number 6. And the other figure we need to pull from the workings is our NCI total. And the NCI total, if we add that up, 188 plus 110 less 20 is 27. Now let's just add up some of our other subtotals, deferred tax 150. We've got 4180 for trade payables. So it's a grand total of 7457. For receivables, it's 1479. For cash, 1410. Inventories, 2038. Intangibles, Two six three. 
and for PPE 1992. So as you can see, the ch this is this is sort of the style of question we quite often see at P2, but there'll be lots of P2 bits and pieces thrown in. And if you add that up, our statement of financial position balances. Now it could be luck that it balanced, or it could be down to having a solid technique. 